thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see you all again. Uh, unbelievably, this is the sixth class of IndieBio, um, and I dare say our best class, and so I'm incredibly thrilled to share uh, these 14 companies that are working on game-changing technologies with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, first, though, I'd like to share with you that uh, our two partners, uh, TechCrunch, is live streaming our demo day currently to uh, two million registered uh, viewers, as well as uh, shout out to SOSV, the Accelerator VC at which I'm a general partner, and Holy Funds Indie Bios Operations. Also, if you would like to reach out to any one of these companies that you're going to see today, uh, we have a website set up for you at indiebio.co, our website, slash demo day. There is a dedicated website that will allow you to get in touch with any one of these companies, uh, if you're press or investors at any point. Thank you. So I started IndieBio three years ago to see if biology can be applied to, uh, as a technology, can be applied to world-changing problems. And I started that as a way to understand if that's even possible. No one had really tried that before. Uh, and then a year ago, things changed for me. Uh, I've had two little girls in the time since, uh, Luca and Freya, and uh, they're three and one. And now that we uh, see in the news every day th things like uh, global warming and, and other problems, I look at them and I see they're actually going to be inheriting the decisions that our generation makes. And so when we think about things like global warming, this is a, a map that was created by NASA uh, that, per that used um, multiple supercomputers to predict the range of temperature uh, increase by 2100. It's an incredible study uh, that was done. The dark red, or any red, is between plus 12 and plus 20 degrees. That's all very real, and that's going to have a real impact on their futures. That's going to bring other questions uh, to bear. How do we feed 10 billion people on the planet, let alone 15 billion people, which is the upper estimates by 2100? That's going to cause a food security issue that needs to be solved. Human suffering and disease continues to be a problem. We have not eliminated all of human suffering and cured diseases. Uh, it's remarkable how quickly everything goes out the window when you become sick or extremely ill or when a loved one becomes extremely ill. Uh, I've lost two close friends uh, and mentors to cancer in recent years. And we hear about this kind of stuff every single day. You hear terrible news every single day. But this afternoon, we get to hear about 14 companies building a future of possibility. And that's a really exciting thing for me. This is what we're doing. This is why we do it. It's to build that future that is better for all of us. And to do so at IndieBio, we've rejected some conventional thinking. One, we've rejected that funding biotech must be expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. It is more expensive than funding, let's say, a software IT company, but it's not as expensive as it used to be, which allows us to try to take on new challenges. We also rejected that scientists are not entrepreneurs. That is absolutely false, and IndieBio is proof, and the companies that we funded and the entrepreneurs that have gone on to do incredible things are proof. And finally, that the prevailing wisdom of biology being only applied to therapeutics. That is also false. Biology is a technology that can solve world problems. And again, we are funding companies that continue to do so. And we do it by helping the entrepreneurs first. We help scientists become entrepreneurs. Here's Uma Valetti. He's a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic. And he had a dream, an idea, that you could make meat without killing cows, uh, a world without slaughter. So he was in our second class, and Memphis Meats went on to raise millions and millions of dollars and is now an incredible purpose-driven organization. I'm really proud of that company. And as we've gone forward in the past three years, something that I've learned and something that's really changed for me is that 
we are no longer a scrappy team trying to figure out whatever it takes to make things work. The experiment has, has worked. It's been proven. And so what we're doing is we're moving towards becoming an institution. And what I mean by that is something that lives beyond myself, this team, something that lives forever. And to do so, we've taken our first steps. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our team. We brought on two incredible new hires. I'll start with them. Uh, Taylor Sittler, our m new medical director. Uh, you'll be hearing from him shortly, but he is a co-founder of Color Genomics, uh, a Howard Hughes fellow, and uh, MD, PhD, and associate professor at uh, UCSF. Maya Lockwood is our new communica uh, communications director. And uh, all the incredible amounts of news and learnings that we're starting to share out of IndieBio is because of her. Uh, I'm ex incredibly thrilled to bring them both on. Um, if you don't know IndieBio, uh, myself, Arvind Gupta, I'm the founder and managing director. Alex Capellian is the program director. June Axep is the science director. Parikshit Sharma, the analyst, and I've introduced the other two. But that's not the only changes we're making. Another thing that's really big for us is we've created what we're calling an adjunct partner board. And we've brought on six new adjunct partners. More to come, too. Uh, I'm incredibly honored and thrilled to share our first six adjunct partners, starting with Timothy Liu. Uh, he is a professor at MIT and the co-founder of Senti, and recently raised over $50 million to build a startup where you're re-engineering uh, life to fight the immune system. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, immunotherapies. So it's an incredible honor to have him come and join us and bring his expertise, both in the synthetic biology realm, but also in his journey to becoming a CEO and bring that to the teams as well. Leo Tesharia, uh, he is co-founder of GeneWeave and uh, helped lead GeneWeave to a successful $500 million exit, which is one of the largest diagnostics exits in history. Shinaz Suleiman is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Theravance and brings incredible buy-side pharma experience to the IndieBio team as well as to the companies we fund. Alexander Sasha Kam is uh, the Senior Vice President, just retired actually, Senior Vice President of uh, all of uh, research and development at Amgen. Uh, that's an, he, he led uh, their small molecules, large molecules, and really brings a huge amount of experience on drug development to our team. Darren Crisitello is the VP of Glo global VP of sales at Color Genomics. We have a saying here that sales solves everything. Well, he's built three billion dollar sales organizations one after another. And so he's able to help our teams figure out what is the best way to move forward on closing that deal. Finally, David Eagleman uh, is a famous neuroscientist with a TV show um, called Brain Games on PBS. He's uh, also an adjunct professor at Stanford. Uh, and fun fact, he's also an um, uh, advisor to the show, uh, to the HBO show Westworld. So uh, it's incredible. It's, I mean, for, for, for me and for the team, it's incredible to work with this kind of talent. What they do is they bring hundreds of years of experience to the, to the table instantly. So if we have a question as to where things are going, they're going to help us set that strategic direction. For teams that we fund, they're going to be able to make introductions as well as help advise the best way forward. So I'm extremely excited about that. So I've asked Tim uh, to share a little bit about his journey from going to the pinnacle of what most scientists want in their career, which is a full tenured professorship at a prestigious university doing groundbreaking work, to leave that and to come and be a CEO of a company. I think uh, he has some incredible insights to share, and I'm excited to introduce uh, Timothy Liu. Well, thanks everyone for, uh, for being here and Arvind for the kind introduction. Uh, it means a lot to me to actually be here and um, to talk to you about some of the work and my own personal journey and also about the mission of IndieBio. I think we're at a really exciting time uh, in, in history and in human development where we can really start thinking about biology as an engineering substrate. 
And for me personally, um, uh, my background originally in computer science and now uh, a professor in biological engineering, I think it's especially pointing to think about, you know, where this field is compared to where, you know, the semiconductor industry was just after the invention of the transistor. If you look at some of the technologies that are underlying, you know, a lot of the companies we're going to hear about today and, and in the future, you know, the ability to rapidly understand uh, biological systems, to read DNA, and then to take that information and turn it into a write and to be able to engineer uh, systems is increasing at an exponential rate and in some cases even faster uh, than what we got from Moore's law. And if you think about what that portends for us, especially because biology touches almost all aspects of human life, uh, despite what people who are developing VR tell you, we're still really biologically driven uh, society. And so thinking about how these technologies are really going to start impacting um, all of our lives and our ability to really understand and, and manipulate biology uh, for beneficial purposes is, I think, is a really uh, exciting prospect. Um, I think throughout this, uh, you know, to, to really try to realize some of the impacts of these technologies, um, we need a community, and I think the indie bio community here is, is quite exciting. Um, clearly, investors, business people are an important part of that community. But at the same time, I think the scientists and the technologists who really have been at the forefront of you know, pushing the boundaries of our scientific understanding and our ability to manipulate these systems are, are an integral part uh, of that conversation, of that, of that process, uh, in large part because they understand what the limitations are, what are the opportunities, and, and where you can, can you really push the boundaries uh, of the technology. So I think uh, that's an exciting opportunity for all the entrepreneurs who participate in this program and, and others who are really trying to push the boundaries of um, uh, biological science. I think, um, you know, I've been fortunate to actually have some of my own students and postdocs join the IndieBio program, and I think uh, to them, I think it's been a, a great opportunity. Um, one of the things we, we tell our, our trainees at MIT is that regardless of what you do, whether you go down an academic path or whether you go into an industrial path, you know, really you should try, try to strive for impact. And for some, that might come in the form of impact in the form of publications and public dissemination of knowledge, and I think that's great. And that's, we really rely on that for a lot of the, the underlying technologies that are driving some of the stories we're going to hear about today. But at the same time, to take that to the next level, to get away just from publishing papers and eventually to help people, to bring new drugs to patients, to you know, bring new, new foods to the world, to change our environmental uh, situation, we need people to be able to step out of that environment and, and really shepherd these technologies uh, to the next level. Um, so just briefly, you know, why am I here in California? Um, you know, I think over the last eight years or so, my lab has been working on a wide range of synthetic biology technologies. How do we take a cell and fundamentally reprogram the DNA in that cell so that we can make it smart? Can we make that cell like a computer so it can do logic? It can do memory, just like your iPhone can. And can we use this ability to then make a drug? So that's what we're doing at Senti Biosciences. Um, we're engineering uh, human cells as a, as a new type of drug. One that can go into the body, that can localize the area's disease, sense disease, and actually respond by making it therapeutic. And I think for me personally, and why it's exciting to again be part of this community, is you know, the technologies that we're using to enable that, this next generation therapy, um, is really something that's not just limited to therapeutics. This idea of taking biology, understanding the, why it works and how it works, and then being able to reprogram it for new activities is not just a therapeutic thing, it's gonna impact diagnostics, it's going to impact the way we make food. It's going to impact the way uh, we treat our environment. Um, and so I think the opportunities here are, are, are quite limitless. Um, we, you know, this is the, the century of biology and biological engineering. And I think here today we're at you know, the beginning of that revolution. And we're going to continue to, to build upon that uh, you know, over many, many decades as the technologies continue to advance. So I you know, welcome you guys. Uh, thank you for spending the time here. Uh, and thank you to Indy Bio for making me a, a part of this, uh, this great journey. So uh, one of the critical ideas that uh, Tim alluded to that it's often overlooked in biotech is the amount of choice that scientists have uh, between traditional routes of academia and industry and uh, creating a startup. Every founder who comes through IndieBio has the option and ability to be publishing papers at prestigious universities or leading teams at large companies. Uh, instead, they're choosing to take the plunge into the unknown of a startup, uh, which is trying to create a, a new path in an existing industry or oftentimes actually create new industries. And I think that's really important because at its core, IndieBio uh, is all about that. Our name is short for independent biology, which is uh, creating a change and securing a path outside of the ivory tower. Um, so founders during the four months they're here are working around the clock to do that. 
They're turning science into a meaningful product. Um, they're pushing their comfort zone every day. They're going out to meet the market. Um, oftentimes, that does mean facing an existential threat to their company and having to pivot, adapt, and change in order to create a, a business model that can actually go forward. And so they're sprinting to get to minimum viable products, um, pilots and revenues, actually getting their first hires, and building the foundation for what we hope will one day become a, a transformational company. So I think it's a real testament to their hard work and the quality of their science that teams of two and three people are able to meaningfully engage with giants of industry like Procter & Gamble, Novartis, and Jividon. And while they're leaving IndieBio, they're getting funded by great firms like True Ventures, Collaborative Fund, NEA, and Founders Fund. So taking a quick second to look at the numbers, um, over the last three years, 81 companies have come through IndieBio, and they've created over $600 million of market value. They've uh, raised over $125 million, and more important than all that, these teams are creating and leading conversations in brand new industries. We're looking at things like the future of food and agriculture, um, biomaterials, regenerative medicine, and much, much more. And they're also creating new communities for biotechnology outside of the traditional hub of Boston, and over 400 jobs have been created by these 81 companies and the founders who started them. So now I'm gonna hand it over to June, our scientific director, to talk about IndieBio beyond the four-month program. Thank you, Alex. It's been an honor this batch working with our companies. Each company has achieved scientific milestones in the four months with us. These are photos of our weekly Killer of the Week competition showing some of our companies achieving their scientific goal. Since the beginning of IndieBio, we believe that great scientists and entrepreneurs come from all walks of life. This class is no exception, with founders stemming from Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Canada, Portugal, Ecuador, Russia, and India. And their age range from 21 to 73. In this class, we've been able to support our female founders with regular events meeting with top VCs and CEOs to openly discuss the challenges we face. Furthermore, we cultivate an environment where men and women support each other. Our community, which includes all of you, have grown to thousands locally and over 20,000 globally, filling our public events with thought leaders and biotech entrepreneurs. Our team has been traveling the globe, giving talks at prestigious conferences and universities. And as batch six draws to a close, we have an open application for our next class starting this summer. And now I'd like to bring up Taylor, our medical director. Thanks. Like Tim <clears throat> and many of the founders you're about to hear from, I made the transition from scientist uh, to entrepreneur. And like many of their journeys, mine began uh, with a, uh, an exploration, a scientific exploration. Um, in medical school, uh, I started by exploring the um, biological networks of the parasite that caused malaria. This, along with an interest in the burgeoning science of DNA sequencing, led me to Charles Chu, an infectious disease specialist at UCSF. Charles and I together uh, created the first um, diagnostic test that could identify any pathogen in a human sample. Uh, that test is now used by the CDC for uh, outbreak detection and monitoring. As the avalanche of DNA sequencing uh, that was being generated from this test threatened to overwhelm the algorithms that we were using to analyze it, uh, I began looking for computational methods that could help us to more effectively handle that data. Together with Dave Patterson, who recently won the Turing Award, uh, we created a small genetics group within the computer science department at UC Berkeley to develop more effective software for handling the reams of genetic data that were generated after the cost of DNA sequencing had dropped so precipitously. After finishing residency, uh, I decided it was time to try a new type of challenge uh, as I wanted to bring this closer to patients. Um, together with two serial entrepreneurs uh, who had both been early executives at Google and then at Twitter, uh, we created uh, Color Genomics, which is dedicated to making clinical genetic testing accessible for people. Um, that transition was, was interesting. Uh, I would say 
uh, one of the most exhilarating journeys that I had been on, but also the scariest, I think. Um, as, you know, startups don't have any of the uh, financial security that academic medicine does, the environment and the incentives are completely different. Uh, and the challenges were foreign to somebody who is a scientist and a clinician. Um, I was lucky to have two seasoned executives to work with as we dealt with the challenges of product design, marketing, um, team development, regulatory challenges, all the, and the myriad things that a burgeoning company faces. Um, after uh, four years at Color Genomics, um, I'm now ready to help others make that transition. Um, and um, it's been really exciting to, to do that at IndieBio. I think um, there are a really great uh, set of companies that um, come through here, and it's been a real, uh, a, uh, it's, I've really enjoyed uh, helping them, watching as, you know, they go through their early challenges and, and successfully navigate the, the early hurdles, uh, make that transition uh, into entrepreneurship, um, and then to, to become and, and to build successful companies. It turns out that there are a, um, a set of, a common set of challenges that pretty much all of these companies face. And so um, it's, been, uh, it's been really interesting to, to work with these folks as they go through it. Uh, and so please uh, join me in welcoming IndieBio Class 6. Hi, my name is Kim, and I'm the CEO of Terramino Foods. And at Terramino, we believe that the future of protein is fungi. People love meat. 95% of the world population eats meat or seafood as a form of protein, and it's oftentimes the centerpiece of a meal. But getting meat from an animal is outdated technology. Why should we be feeding an animal on average 30 calories simply to get one calorie out? Animal agriculture is an extremely inefficient process, and it takes a large pull animal muscle fiber underneath a microscope. So we saw that their fibers range from 1 to 10 microns in size. So here we're talking about texture. And then we evaluated plants, and we saw that plant fibers were 20 microns and above, which means they're simply too large to pass. So what happens is they're often pulverized into a powder and then reconstituted. So we had to ask ourselves, is there a better source in nature that's not from the animal kingdom and not from the plant kingdom that has the same texture of animal muscle fiber? And that's when we found fungi. Fungi fibers grow from 5 to 10 microns in size, so they're in the same range as animal muscle fiber. So when you bite into our fungi, it's a more familiar feeling. So it has that same texture of meat. And our fungi solution is truly no compromises. It's all natural. We only use strains of fungi that have a long history of consumption in the human diet. On top of this, we don't do any genetic modifications to our strains. Our process is completely animal free, and our feedstock is extremely flexible. In terms of the nutrition of our fungi, our fungi has a bioavailable source of protein, similar to meat. So you're not compromising in nutrition, because our fungi have a complete amino acid profile as well as micronutrients. And to top it all off, our fungi grows in a way in that which it produces a neutral tasting protein, which means we have the opportunity to make the best tasting meat and seafood products on the market without any masking agents or texturization processes. So let's go into how we grow our fungi. So we're using the age-old process of brewing, similar to beer or sake brewing, to grow our fungi. So today it kind of looks like this. You might have seen one of these brewing vessels in a local brew pub. So what we do is we add our fungi, as well as sugars and simple nutrients for them to grow. They grow in fibers, and in about four days we can harvest them. What do we do next? We'll combine our fungi with natural flavors and ingredients, using food science techniques to make products that people know and love. And we can make any type of meat or seafood product. So we had to figure out what is the best first application for our technology. And we saw that there was an opportunity specifically in seafood alternatives because they're simply lacking. And when we dove deeper, we saw that although salmon is the most widely consumed fish, there are no salmon alternatives on the market. So that's why we started there. 
So since coming to IndieBio four months ago, we've been able to grow our fungi with large yield increases and formulate salmon products. So I'm really excited today to show you our first product. This is Terramino salmon. Our salmon has the proper taste, texture, and nutrition, even down to the omega-3 content of fish, with no compromises whatsoever. We have the full experience of eating a salmon burger or any type of meat product without the toxins or environmental degradation. And we're not stopping here. We'll be formulating a full seafood product line and then soon after a meat product line. And we are going to be in restaurants at the end of this year. What gets us really excited about our technology is the efficiencies that we can get, which translates to cost savings. Currently, at a very small scale, we're producing at roughly $15 a pound. During our seed stage, we'll be able to get our proteins down to the same price as salmon wholesale. And at large scale, our proteins get well below 50 cents a pound, which means we're truly competitive with any source of animal protein, even factory farmed chicken. And we have the best team to take this product to market. I'm a biologist by training and a member of the Institute of Food Technologists, and I also have eight years of management experience within the food industry. My co-founder, Josh, is a bioengineer and computer scientist and has experience working at large fermentation companies. We both come out of the Alternative Meat Lab program at UC Berkeley, where we met our advisor, Ricardo. He's a chemical engineer, Berkeley professor, as well as food industry veteran. So we invite you to join us to make fungi the future of protein. We're currently closing our seed round, and we're always looking to start conversations with potential Series A investors and looking for partnerships as well as passionate talent to join our rapidly growing team. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nathaniel. I'm a founder of Nivian Therapeutics, and we are eliminating the shields that protect cancer from existing treatments. The vast majority of people with cancer are prescribed chemotherapy as the front line of care. However, in many cancers, chemo remains both ineffective and highly toxic with terrible side effects. Nivian is developing the first small molecules that can reformulate with a wide range of chemotherapies to create new products in every major cancer that have higher effectiveness and fewer side effects. Recent advances in biology have made it possible to understand cancer at the molecular level. We now know specific proteins responsible for the failure of chemotherapy. For example, drug metabolizing enzymes like cytidine deaminase break chemotherapies down into an inactive form. Multi-drug efflux transporters like the ABC family of proteins find chemo within cancer cells and kick them out, rendering chemo ineffective and poisoning healthy surrounding tissue. Collectively, drug resistance proteins like these are responsible for the failure of dozens of chemotherapies. But past efforts to target this resistance have failed because they have only been able to go after individual proteins, leaving others to pick up the slack. Our team from Harvard and MIT have identified the first powerful upstream regulator of these downstream resistance proteins. This target, called HIPPO, represents a unique opportunity to eliminate the barriers that protect cancer from treatment. When HIPPO is active, drug resistance protein levels are high and chemotherapies are ineffective. When HIPPO is inactive, drug resistance protein levels are low and chemotherapy is able to more easily enter and kill cancer cells at much lower doses meaning more effective treatments and fewer side effects for patients. We set out to prove this at IndieBio using shRNA to inactivate HIPPO in drug-resistant cancer cells. Here, we saw 50 to 70% reductions in levels of key drug metabolizing enzymes and drug efflux transporters. This translated into dramatic reductions in the viability of pancreatic cancer cells that had previously resisted every available treatment. What's special about HIPPO is that it's the only target in cancer demonstrated to play this key regulatory role on so many downstream resistance proteins. As a result of this target validation and this unique therapeutic potential, we have begun developing the first potent inhibitors of HIPPO activity. Here, one of our small molecules is able to inactivate HIPPO at nanomolar concentrations, a key measure of drug-like potency. 
Our aim is to reformulate small molecules like this candidate with chemotherapies to produce new products in every major cancer that have higher, uh, higher effectiveness and fewer side effects. This enables a unique business model. Branded chemotherapies generate hundreds of millions of dollars in annual revenue while covered by 20 years of patent exclusivity. However, when those patents expire, revenue plunges as prices fall to meet generic competition. That is where Nivian comes in. Nivian reformulations are not only a better product for patients with higher effectiveness and fewer side effects, they also restart the 20-year patent exclusivity of the new reformulated products, which belong exclusively to Nivian, and mean that we can recapture hundreds of millions of dollars in otherwise lost revenue for every drug with which we reformulate a Nivian molecule. And because HIPPO is a regulator of proteins responsible for the failure of dozens of chemotherapies, we can do more than 40 of these reformulations to go after a total addressable market of over $26 billion. We have negotiated exclusive rights to a first-in-class patent from Harvard Medical School that covers inactivation of HIPPO in combination with chemotherapies. We filed our own broader PCT application that also covers the use of these molecules with and as immunotherapies, an exciting further route of exploration. And we have a proprietary drug discovery engine that allows us to rapidly identify and develop new HIPPO inhibitors at lower cost than industry standards. This engine includes proprietary homology modeling, convolutional neural networks, biochemical assays, and now dozens of small molecule compounds that we are synthesizing, testing, and patenting. Leveraging this drug discovery platform, we were able over the past four months at IndieBio to develop our first HIPPO inhibitors with just $178,000 compared to industry standards for similar work of over $2 million across two to three years of R&D. Nivian is not just developing one small molecule against one target for one type of cancer. HIPPO contains five core components, and we have already developed multiple inhibitors against two of them to start. Once optimized, each of these compounds can be reformulated with any one of dozens of different chemotherapies to create a new front line of care in every major cancer that outperforms the current standard of care in terms of both effectiveness and side effects. We are 18 months of development to get our existing inhibitors to the optimized point where they can enter IND-enabling trials, a key de-risking milestone prior to human studies. These optimized compounds will also serve as the foundation for an interim step in our business model sub-licensing partnerships with pharmaceutical companies who have chemotherapies that are going off patent. These licensing partnerships will include an upfront payment, milestone payments, and a downstream royalty, enabling Nivian to begin generating revenue by the end of next year before we've entered any of our own clinical studies. We've spoken to seven pharmaceutical companies and identified the specific metrics that our molecules need to meet in order to qualify for these partnerships. We are 18 months away from this commercial revenue-generating milestone. Nikita Shah and I founded Nivian as scientific researchers at Harvard and MIT in partnership with the chair of the Systems Biology Department at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Mark Kirshner, who all, now also leads our scientific advisory board. We've recruited two exceptional scientists. Dr. Ken Fong is a principal chemist from Allergan who led drug discovery projects there for 17 years, racking up 56 biochemical patents. Dr. Dharmendra Singh is a veteran cancer biologist from Houston Methodist, UCLA, and the NIH, with 18 peer-reviewed publications in cancer biology. In addition to Dr. Kirshner, our scientific advisory board includes the scientific founders of Moderna Therapeutics and Searchers Pharmaceuticals, as well as a clinical trials investigator from Massachusetts General Hospital. Together, we are seeking to reduce the side effects of chemotherapy and make it a more effective treatment for cancer. We are raising $3.5 million to optimize our compounds to the commercial and developmental milestones that I've laid out. Our aim is to prolong and improve the lives of the millions of patients worldwide who rely on chemotherapy every year. I hope that some of you will join us in our journey to transform the standard of care in cancer therapeutics. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Matias Biel. I'm co-founder and CEO at Bflow. At Bflow, we are increasing crop yields by providing the next generation of bee pollination to farmers. Did you know that more than 70% of global crops depend on bee pollination to produce fruits and seeds? 
Without bees, we wouldn't have avocados, cherries, almonds, and blueberries, among other fruits. These are blueberry flowers, and they need that bees transport pollen from the male part of the flower to the female one in order to develop a fruit. More pollen being deposited in a flower means more seeds, and more seeds means bigger fruits. This means there is a strong relation between bee pollination and crop yields. Since Green Revolution, we focus mainly on fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation systems, and plant genetics to increase yields. However, today, these technologies are increasing just between 2 and 5% yields, while we are expecting that food demand will increase 70% by 2050. So the question is, how are we going to guarantee food security for future generations with current solutions? At Biflo, we consider the agriculture industry has forgotten one of the most important topics in plant biology, bee pollination. The bee pollination industry has remained the same for the past century. Farmers are renting beehives from beekeepers to pollinate their crops in the same way they did decades ago. There hasn't been any innovations or technologies applied to bee pollination in order to increase crop yields with bees. At Beeflow, we are changing this reality. By understanding bees' biology and how they interact with flowers, we are developing strong and smart bees for crop pollination. To do so, we feed our bees with organic molecules compounds to enhance their immune system and make them work more hours, even under cold weather. <laughs> also, we train them to pollinate specific tarek crops. By feeding them with organic molecules compounds in blueberry fields, for example, we can make them focus exclusively on blueberry flowers instead of getting distracted by other flowers. <laughs> Lastly, we place beehives in strategic locations. We do so to ensure that all the trees in the field get the amount of pollen they need to maximize its production. This is a topic ignored by traditional beekeepers. Since we started working two years ago in Argentina, we decided to perform several experiments to measure the impact of these technologies in crop yields. After working with nine of the largest farmers in almonds, blueberries, apples, and kiwis, we have increased between 20 to 90% crop yields. Yes, you heard right. 20 to 90% crop yields. Based on these results, we decided to come to California to disrupt the largest almond market in the world, where 80% of the almonds of the world are being produced. In this video, you can see our team working with Harris Wolf Growers, one of the three largest almond farmers in the US. Together, we performed several experiments to measure the impact of our technologies in bee pollination compared to conventional pollination. Today, I can share proudly that we have increased seven times the amount of flights our bees are doing under cold weather. Also, we have increased more than two times the amount of pollen that our bees are carrying. This means a huge impact in bee pollination efficiency. After only two months working in California, we captured the attention of several farmers. Because of this, we started to pre-sell our next season, and we recently signed our first LOI for $52,000 for the next almond season. Also, we are in conversations with Driscoll's, the largest berry grower in the world, to perform several bee pollination projects together. Last but not least, we are scaling up our operations in Argentina with all the farmers I mentioned before. Biflo has a bees as a service business model. <laughs> we provide the next generation of bee pollination services to farmers by developing strong and smart bees. To do so, we feed our bees with our molecules and place beehives strategically in the field. During bloom, we are measuring pollination efficiency by understanding the amount of visits the flowers are getting and how strong bees are working. Once the bloom is over, we get paid by the farmer and we move our beehives to the next crop, 
we charge farmers $400 in average per acre plus 20% revenue share on increased yields. To give you an example on our unit economics, with 1,000 beehives, we can work with several crops in a season. We can start with blueberries, then move to almonds, and then end with cherries. And we can generate almost $700,000 in a season with 70% of margins. Based on this information, and considering that acres of crops that depend on bee pollination have increased three times over the past 50 years, we are targeting a global potential market of $10 billion. Our next milestones are building our headquarters and operations in California to get ready for the next season, starting this December. Also, increase our revenue and customer relationships within the US and Argentina. Lastly, expand our scientific knowledge to pollination of new crops, like alfalfa or avocados, and into new bee species, like bumblebees. None of all this could be generated without the great team that we built. About myself, I have a business background and a strong entrepreneurial experience in Latin America. Dr. Pedro Neri has a PhD on bees' immune system, and Dr. Agustin Saez has a PhD on bee pollination. Both of them have almost 20 years of experience combined in the field. To accomplish our milestones, we are raising $3 million in our seed round. We welcome you to join us and generate together a huge impact in food production. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Nishit Pancholi. I'm the president and co-founder of Jointech Labs. We at Jointech Labs are excited to bring standardized point-of-care stem cell therapies for you. This is an example of an invasive arthroscopic surgery, one that involves enduring pain and a long rehab. However, in the coming decades, 50% of these surgeries won't be done anymore. Instead of doing surgeries, we will use our body's own stem cells to repair and regenerate damaged tissues. The market for such regenerative medicine therapies is $25 billion today and expected to double to $50 billion in just seven to eight years. For example, a patient with a knee meniscus tear or a spinal injury for that matter currently has surgery and a long rehab as the only option to treat it. However, if stem cell therapy becomes a clinical option, these patients will be able to use their own stem cells as therapies. The FDA realizes the huge potential of stem cell therapy and has brought a new fast-track approval process called as RMAT, or Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy, which allows to bring stem cell therapies to the market sooner because it does not follow the gold standard clinical trial pathway which takes about eight to 10 years and tens of millions of dollars. Instead, for RMAT, upon submission of proof of concept and safety studies, we can get an IND with an RMAT designation followed by an approved marketable stem cell therapy all in about two to three years. So what's stopping stem cell therapy to become the standard of care? It's astounding that it's actually the logistics. Currently, the tools required to derive stem cells are found only in a lab and not in a doctor's office. But the FDA does not allow the doctors to ship the cells from the clinic to a distant lab for processing. Thus, shipping is not feasible. Also, it is impractical to change the current infrastructure in the doctor's office to build a lab because there are barriers of high cost, $200,000 decreased feasibility because it requires lab space and certifications, as well as issues with quality assurance. Therefore, at Jointech Labs, we have shrunk all the lab tools required to derive stem cells and have created a stem cell therapy device that can work with the current infrastructure at the doctor's office. We call it Mini-STEM. Mini-STEM is a single-use disposable lab in your hands, which has dual functions, 
it can give you your own stem cells from fat, or you can get a cell-enriched fat graft. Most importantly, Ministem makes regenerative medicine FDA approvable because now the doctors can get stem cell therapies in the clinic from the patient in about one and a half hours without the cells ever leaving the facility. Next, you will see a video how a doctor is using Ministem to process fat collected from the patient in the office to extract purified concentrated stem cells. The fat from the patient is collected and introduced into the device and washed thoroughly. It is then centrifuged using a tabletop centrifuge in the doctor's office. Next, a reagent is applied for stem cell extraction and further processed in a shaker in the office. The stem cell fraction is then extracted and further purified and concentrated. The final stem cell fraction is collected and is ready for injection for any indication. So how do we know our device gives excellent quality and quantity of stem cells? Of course, we have our own internal validations, but we have external validations, most important one being at Stanford. Their data also shows 2.1 times the number of stem cells per volume of fat using mini stem as compared to their own lab protocol. Thus, a handheld device can give more clinical efficacy than a $200,000 lab based on these results. As a further validation, we have been included in the IRB at Stanford and are in the process of being in the IRB at USC. We work with key opinion leaders in the field and have pre-sales worth $960,000 from surgical centers and clinics to purchase Ministem upon approval. We have a collaboration with AAOS, which gives us access to more than 200 doctors focused on regenerative orthopedics as potential buyers of Ministem. With Alma Lasers, a multi-million dollar company in the plastic surgery business, we have a mutual interest for Ministem distribution. Upon 510K approval within the next three months, we will bring Ministem as a standalone device for plastic surgeons, orthopedic practices, and hospital systems. Price for each disposable device is $600 with a 75% margin. But our ultimate goal is to bring stem cell therapeutics to the market, the first indication being in orthopedics. We will use the RMAT pathway to bring stem cell therapies to the market, and price per therapy will be $3,000 with a 90% margin. We have already accomplished our first step towards our first stem cell therapeutic product for osteoarthritis. We have proof of concept data that shows that mini stem stem cells can be differentiated into cartilage cells in vitro. We have shown it by two ways. One, by staining of these differentiated cartilage cells, as well as release of glycosaminoglycans by these differentiated cartilage cells. We have two full patents granted in the US we have several CIP and PCTs pending worldwide. We aim to get 510K approval in the next three months and bring the product to market by October 2018. For stem cell therapeutics, we will begin safety studies for osteoarthritis by October 2018, and using RMAT pathway, we will bring the first stem cell therapeutic product for osteoarthritis by early 2020. We will target more indications in wound healing and vascular indications starting uh, end of 2019. We have an excellent team. Dr. Nathan Katz has a PhD and more than 20 years of experience in the stem cell biology field. I am a medical doctor with a focus on clinical applications of stem cells. Felix has a long-standing experience in business and sales. We have an accomplished advisory board. Just to name a few, Dr. Patricia Zuck is the discoverer of adipose or fat-derived stem cells, and she sits on our board. We work with Dr. Kahn. She's a pioneer in the orthopedic applications of stem cells. We are raising $3 million, and we welcome you to join in the opportunity to bring mini-stem and standardized point-of-care stem cell therapies to the market, not in 10 years, but now. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Gabe Hitchcock, and I'm the COO and co-founder of Onkinetics Pharmaceuticals, where we are engineering the future of gene therapy. Now, as some of you may know, gene therapy is an approach wherein genetic material is added to a cell in order to catalyze a therapeutic effect. However, the problem with gene therapies developed to date is that they're not selective. What this means for a patient is if they're given a gene therapy, while it may get into the intended tissue, it often ends up in other parts of the body where it can cause serious harm. But what if we could create a therapy that was specifically targeted only diseased tissue and not healthy tissue? With over 16 million cancer patients in the US and hundreds of billions of dollars spent every year on treatment and care, the value of such a therapy is tremendous. At Onkinetics, we were solving the problem of selectivity by engineering a gene therapy that only activates within the distinct regulatory environment of a cancer cell. We achieved this by using small, non-coding RNAs. These are RNAs that are only present within distinct cells in the body and act as a functional off switch for gene expression. When a messenger RNA is encoded in the cell, it floats around waiting to become a protein. However, if the corresponding SNC RNA is also present, then it binds to and prevents expression of that protein. This process is called RNA silencing, and it's happening all the time in every one of our cells and every one of our bodies. At Onkinetics, we found a way to leverage this basic genetic mechanism to create a trigger for a kill gene that would only activate within cancer, not within healthy tissue. We call this approach genomics-informed drug design. We start by taking genetic information from cancer patients. We then use that information to create our trigger, which is incorporated into our gene therapy and given back to the patients. The first step in this process involves the identification of differentially expressed SNC RNAs. These are RNAs that are only found within distinct cell types in the body. Now, when we looked between cancer and healthy tissue, we found not 10 or 100, but thousands of these RNAs that we could choose from to guide our therapy. From these, we then find the highest differentially expressed and incorporate those back into our gene therapy as targets for SNC RNA. Constructed like this, if our therapy finds its way into healthy tissue, then the non -coding, small, small non-coding RNAs that are present in the cell will bind to and prevent its expression. The added benefit that comes from the heightened selectivity of this platform is that it allows us to be delivery agnostic, which is a pretty nice place to be for a pharmaceutical company, because it means that we can be very flexible when it comes to choosing our delivery mechanism, because we're not dependent upon delivery to achieve selectivity. To date, we are partnered with Karma Biotechnologies, a tissue engineering company, to use their nanoparticle system to create a viable product. Now, when our therapy is introduced to a patient, one of two things can happen. In the case of a cancer cell, the DNA is taken up, it's identified as native, it's red, our kill gene is expressed, and the cancer cells die. If it's taken into a healthy tissue, then the small non-coding RNAs that are present in the cell will bind to and prevent expression of our kill gene, thus leaving the healthy tissue unharmed. And when we first came to IndieBio from UCSF, we wanted to validate this approach within breast cancer, and so we chose just one small non-coding RNA to guide the expression of our therapy. These are the results from that study. This is our healthy breast model. You'll notice within the first day, there's a pretty sizable dip, which we attribute to some noise, not from the therapy itself. But the important takeaway from this graph is that during the course of the experiment, there's very little difference between the treated and untreated healthy breast cells. What this tells us is that the single non-coding RNA we chose was sufficient to prevent expression. Now compare this to our triple negative breast cancer cells. And you'll see there's a pretty stark difference between treated and untreated. By the fourth day, we've killed about 50% of the cancer cells. By the eighth day, we've killed 90% of the cells. And onto the ninth, 10th, and 11th day, even when the cancer cells that are untreated begin to grow and proliferate, we continue to achieve selective killing and repression. Next, I'm going to show you two videos from this experiment. On the left side of the screen, you'll see our untreated cancer cells. On the right side, our treated cells. As expected for the untreated cancer, there's very little change during the course of the experiment. However, for our treated cancer cells, you can see there's almost immediate death as the cells begin to flicker out. And by the ninth day, we've again killed nearly all of the cancer cells within this population. 
To date, our pipeline consists of our triple negative breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. However, because what we're engineering here is a bioengineering platform for creating targeted therapies, as we move forward and expand our company, so too will our pipeline to include these additional indications. Onkinetics owns full rights to its IP, has filed provisionals, and is working with Cooley LLP to strengthen and expand our portfolio. The founding team consists of myself, Gabe Hitchcock, my co-founder and CEO, Luke Grunert, who also invented this technology while he was at UCSF, and our chief scientific officer, Jeffrey Sargent, who has a storied career both in academia and in biotech. We've surrounded ourselves with an advisory board of leaders in the industry. They include Admiral Joxel Garcia, who is the former 13th U.S. Assistant Secretary of Health, the former Director of Cancer Prevention at MD Anderson, and the current Chief Medical Officer at American Express, as well as Dr. Michael Kmark, who is the former Director of Product Development at Pfizer and current CTO at VeerBio, and Dr. Alexander Kam, who is the former Executive Director of Oncology at Amgen and the Global Head of Oncology at Novartis. Our scientific advisors include Drs. Rossi, Morris, and Walters, each of whom are world leaders in their respective fields of gene therapy and non-coding RNAs. At the present moment, we're in the midst of our in vitro validation, moving very quickly toward our in vivo animal studies. By 2020, we anticipate being pre-ND ready. Throughout this process, we'll continue to optimize to increase both the efficacy and the selectivity of our therapy, as well as expand our portfolio. To achieve these aims, we're raising a $5 million seed round for which we've already received several soft commitments and much interest. My name is Gabe Hitchcock, and we are engineering the future of gene therapy. I invite you to join us. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Flores. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Antibiotic Adjuvant. We're transforming the treatment of infection diseases by using software. We have a great problem in our society right now, and that is that we overuse and misuse antibiotics. At any given moment, 30 to 50% of antibiotics prescriptions are either unnecessary or incorrect. This leads to an increase in antibiotic-resistant bacteria, or so-called superbugs, and to an increase in infections, particularly infections we acquire when we go to a hospital to receive care. Right now, one of every 25 patients who go to a hospital actually acquire an infection. And according to the CDC, this is costing our economy $90 billion per year, and more importantly, 90,000 people are dying due to hospital acquiring infections and antibiotic resistant each year. The problem is so big, the World Health Organization has declared antibiotic resistance as one of the biggest threats to global health, food security, and development. In hospitals, the, this happens because the information lives in silos, and only a small percentage of antibiotic prescriptions are actually optimized to reduce antibiotic resistance. This leads to an increase in patient length of stay, so they stay longer in the hospital, and obviously, the hospital has to treat them, so there's an increase in cost for the hospital, and there's also a decrease in revenue because they do not get reimbursed for these uh, procedures. Now, for us, this is important because we see an increase in deadly bacteria such as MRSA and C. difficile. This is just unacceptable, and to fix this, we have created Smart Steward. Smart Steward leverages medical information with machine learning to reduce antibiotic resistance and improve patient outcomes. Our software works on two levels. At the, pre at the prescriber level, we give the doctor all the information he needs to determine if a patient needs antibiotics. This helps the doctor prevent the unnecessary use, uh, prescriptions of antibiotics. Then, once the doctor determines a patient actually needs antibiotics, we recommend the doctor the best antibiotics to kill the infection, but also to reduce the antibiotic resistance in the facility. To arrive to these personalized recommendations, we go through the patient's medical record and we look for information such as allergies, renal functions, and different physiological information. 
Then we go through the facilities ecology, and we look for antibiotic usage patterns and antibiotic resistant patterns. And we put all this information through our recommendation engine to provide the best antibiotic for the patient, the facility, in that moment in time. Then, on the administration side, we give the administrator tools to actually control the use of antibiotics. Hospitals right now control the use of antibiotics by implementing what's called an antibiotic stewardship program. By federal law, they're mandated to actually have one in place. The problem with the current antibiotic stewardship programs is that hospitals use information that is 6 to 12 months old to actually derive antibiotic usage policy. Our antibiotic, usage, uh, our antibiotic stewardship program uses real-time information and actually adapt to changes as changes in the facility happen. So it's highly adaptable. Then, using machine learning and this information, we can actually predict infection, complications, and antibiotic resistance before it even happens. Here's an example of how we can, for the first time, show the administration a visualization of bacteria as, as it is spreading through the facility. You can see to my left here, there's C. diff spreading, and we can actually tell the administrator where it's happening and where it's going to happen next. This allows them to actually take action and control resistance. We did a clinical study where we optimized the antibiotic use for 3,500 patients through 18 months in a hospital. The result was that we decreased the patient length of stay, and we actually saved the hospital $2 million. This process was very labor-intensive and time-consuming, but Smart Steward now automates the whole thing. So it's actually now scalable. We're very excited because we're, creating, we're saving life, but also because we're creating a great business. Our total addressable market in the US is $2.3 billion. And we're starting with the skilled nursing facilities. We're starting with skilled nursing facilities because the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has mandated that they have an antibiotic stewardship program in place by next year. And right now, they are looking for a solution. For skilled nursing facilities, hiring staff is simply cost prohibitive, so they need a better alternative. Our business models are software as a service. We charge hospitals $20,000 per month, and we charge skilled nursing facilities $2,000 per month, plus a $20 per bed per month fee. We are already live in a skilled nursing facility, actually. The skilled nursing facility is called Ayers, and doctor, doctors there love our product because they have become more efficient. And the administrator now has peace of mind because she doesn't have to worry about new regulation changes. Ayers is part of a bigger group that owns 20 more facilities. Through conversations, we find out we're going to save the whole group $700,000 per year just in compliance cost. We have a letter of intent signed with a hospital in St. Augustine, Florida named Flagler, where we expect to do our first pilot in early 2019. We can only accomplish all this because we have a great team. I have been doing sales and business development for the past 13 years. Luis Garcia, our CTO, is a user experience specialist who has been doing enterprise software applications for the past 13 years as well. And another co-founder, our medical director, Dr. Robert Yancey, he's an infectious disease specialist. He has been doing this for 20 years, and he has led the creation and implementation of antibiotic stewardship programs in different hospitals in Florida. He has also sold a company in this space. We have a great advisory board as well. We have an entrepreneur who has taken a company from zero to IPO in this space. We have PharmD, and we have an infection disease specialist, all of them helping us make this into a reality. To scale operations, we're raising $1.5 million, and I hope you can join us in changing the way infectious diseases are treated today. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Un and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Dahlia Biosciences. 
and we are harnessing CRISPR technology in a novel way to develop the next generation of cell and tissue analysis for precision medicine. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And without accurate and reproducible biomarker analysis, there is no precision medicine. In recent years, the number of clinical trials incorporating biomarkers has been growing exponentially, and it's expected that the market for tools to measure biomarkers in our bodies will reach nearly 12 billion in a couple of years. Now, while there's been an explosion of genomic information driven by next-generation sequencing that's connected DNA and RNA changes to disease and treatment response, this is often done on variable and bulk clinical samples. There's a bottleneck in actually translating what these changes mean in specific cell types and at the tissue level. And this is very important in order to effectively translate genomic biomarkers from discovery into drug development and ultimately the clinic. Our vision is to bridge the gap between genomics and cell analysis. And by using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we can create a scalable and efficient way to detect any DNA or RNA biomarker directly in cells and tissues. Some of you may already know about CRISPR-Cas9. It's already used by thousands of labs today as a simple gene editing technology to make very specific changes to the DNA inside your cells. The beauty of Cas9 is that the binding specificity of the enzyme can be easily changed by simply designing and synthesizing a new synthetic guide RNA, which the enzyme complexes with, in a week's time. This is in contrast to months and months of protein engineering that only a few select labs could do with previous technologies. So our idea is to take the advantages of Cas9 as a nucleic acid targeting tool and redirect it and apply it to directly detect DNA and RNA biomarkers directly in cells and tissues. Importantly, Cas9 has already been demonstrated to uh, bind RNA, both in vitro and in live cells, by leading academic research labs. The RNA targeting Cas9 technology was developed in the lab of Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley, and we've secured an exclusive license for research tools and diagnostic applications for the underlying IP. So how will this technology actually translate into the real world? Well, the bulk of cell and tissue analysis today is done using flow cytometers and microscopes that can detect fluorescently labeled biomarkers directly in cells and tissues. Our detection kits will be compatible with these existing instruments and workflows. Importantly, we will also be compatible with protein detection protocols, which means we will be able to detect DNA, RNA, and protein changes at the same time with single cell resolution. As initial proof of concept, we applied our technology to the detection of DNA telomeres inside human cells. DNA telomeres are repetitive sequences that are found at the end of your chromosomes that decrease as your cells divide. And in recent years, there's been thousands of publications studying the length of your DNA telomeres and how it's connected to aging, longevity, and other types of diseases. The picture that you see here are cells that we took that we fixed permeabilized and stained with our fluorescently tagged Cas9 probe designed to target DNA telomeres. And you can see very specific staining of these regions as illustrated by the punctate dots in the cell nucleus of these cells, which are stained in blue. Importantly, we also validated that we can measure the increased fluorescence from these cells using flow cytometry against a negative control assay. DNA telomeres will be the first of many applications on our roadmap. Over the last couple of weeks, we've signed a couple of pilot agreements and have a third in the pipeline based on simply word of mouth. Our next steps here is to continue to optimize these assays in preparation for a launch, either as a service or a product by the end of the year. Beyond DNA, we're excited about expanding the analytical breadth of our technology to the detection of RNA biomarkers, in particular high-value targets that are important for immuno-oncology and oncology drug development applications. Our business model is very simple and scalable. We will sell very high-margin DNA and RNA detection kits directly to the end customer. The average consumable spend per customer is expected to be on the tens of thousands of dollars per year, and there's tens of thousands of addressable customers. 
From a process standpoint, the customer would simply go online to submit their order, which we will then receive, design the assays, manufacture, kit, and ship back the reagents back to the customer in a matter of weeks. Versus competing technologies, we will offer the shortest and simplest workflow, which means faster time to data and less opportunity for mistakes. Importantly, we believe we have the headroom to scale our multiplex, which means to be able to detect many more DNA and RNA changes versus existing techniques. I'm really proud to be part of a great team to execute against this opportunity. I've known my co-founder, Michael Lin, for nearly a decade, and he and I have nearly 30 years of combined experience in the research tools and diagnostic space. In addition, we're excited to have recruited Alan Chan to the team. Alan and I have known each other for over 15 years when we gra attended graduate school together, and he recently completed postdoctoral training at Mount Sinai Hospital on a very advanced tissue imaging technology. In addition, we have a strong scientific advisory board led by my other co-founder, Dr. Sam Sternberg, a co-inventor of the RNA targeting Cas9 technology and a former graduate student of Jennifer Doudna. Sam and I most recently worked together at Caribou Biosciences, a leading CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology company. In addition, we have Alex Shalek from MIT Broad, a leader in single cell genomics. And finally, Dr. Jared Brooks, from MD Anderson, one of the top cancer research institutes in the country, and he has strong expertise in both advanced imaging and cytometry technologies. Over the past few months here at IndieBio, we've made a lot of progress, both technically as well as securing foundational IP for our target applications. Our next milestones will be to launch the DNA telomere assays and to improve our technology for the detection of RNA biomarkers directly in cells and tissues with a goal of launching early access products by next year. We're seeking two and a half million dollars to fund this next exciting phase of our company. I look forward to speaking with many of you afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ilya Schmidt, and I'm a founder of Mesomax. At Mesomax, we are working on next generation bone fracture healing, and we're developing a drug that accelerates fracture healing up to two times. Every single day, people break their bones. Whether it's a car accident, falling off the chair, or playing football, it's a very common injury. Usually, a simple fracture takes six to eight weeks to heal. However, as we get older, the level of hormone drops, and our bones don't heal as fast. There are 8 million fractures in the United States every year, including 600,000 delayed and non-union fractures, which is a type of fracture that takes much longer to heal, or it simply does not heal at all. Non-union fractures are only 8% of total fractures. However, they are the most expensive one to treat, and it's a $9.2 billion market. So the problem is not the fracture itself, the problem is, despite this overwhelming need for the market with aging population, there is still no FDA-approved drug to help fracture heal. And we believe we have the answer to this problem. Let me introduce MMX. We developed a small molecule drug that targets calcium delivery and accelerates fracture healing up to two times faster. We called our molecule MMX. So let me explain how it works. Calcium-based minerals are significant components of the bone tissue. So the regulation of calcium delivery is critically important for bone formation. Bone formation cells regenerate bone tissue when hormones bind and trigger signals within the cell. This causes L-type channels to open and calcium to flow into the cell, activating bone repair. If for some reason there is any hormonal imbalance, L-type channels do not work properly and flow calcium is interrupted. So what MMX does, MMX mimics the presence of hormones safely and efficiently triggering flow of calcium through the cell and accelerating bone repair. Thus, MMX activates the regeneration of bone tissue by passing hormones. 
To confirm efficacy of MMX, we carried out a lot of animal studies. One of our initial in vivo efficacy study was done in rabbits. The hole was created, and you can see here, the MMX group had completely healed within 90 days. When we finish our experiment after 180 days, control group still has not healed. Does MMX group heal twice faster compared to control group? Our compound is not only efficient, and it's also safe. To show safety, we compared animals given high doses of traditional forms of calcium versus high doses of MMX. Most calcium compounds on the market are ionized form of calcium, and at high doses, precipitate in blood vessels and cause tissue damage. And you can see it on the left with the control group. With MMX on the right, we did not see any calcium precipitation because this is non-ionized form of calcium. Our drug was developed in the Russian Academy of Sciences. We conducted many in vivo studies with more than 1,200 animals involved, which confirms that our drug is safe and efficient. We passed safety and toxicology studies and began to sell it as a supplement. So we observed more than 1,000 patients taking our compound. And we were encouraged at the results we have been seeing. So we decided to truly unlock value for MMX was to move to the United States and go through the stringent FDA trials and to make it as an FDA-approved drug. As I mentioned before, we observed more than 1,000 patients. Here is an example of one of our largest human studies with more than 300 people going through tooth extraction before getting dental implant. In order to install dental implant after tooth extraction, you have to wait when your bone is completely healed. So what we observe, the first group of people who had no treatment healed after 12 months. The group who used crushed bone allograft, which is one of the standards of care, healed after eight months. Another group who used allograft and infrared therapy healed after about eight months as well. The group of people who used MMX healed in four months, half the time compared to the standard of care treatment. And this is consistent with our animal studies. And this is huge. So let me show you some individual examples. Male, 47 years old, he was in a car accident, and he shattered his leg. After 10 months, two surgeries, and use of stable plate, his bone did not heal. We put him on MMX, and after nine months, his bone healed completely. Another example, 11 years old girl with a typical non-union fractures, which did not heal for two years. She used MMX for 16 months, and her bone healed completely. So, we have safe and efficient drug, which was proved by independent animal studies and human observations. What's most important, our compound is qualified for an accelerated pathway using 505B2 application based on our studies and studies that have already been published. This allows us to do GLP efficacy study, GLP toxicology study, and phase one human trials before IND. Then we move to phase three study with expected approval in four years. This accelerated pathway gives us a unique opportunity to reduce registration time for our drug in four years only in drastically increased value of investing money in short period of time. We have patents in more than 30 countries, including the US patent, which was granted in 2014. To get our FDA approval, we have a team of professionals who can get it done. Our team consists of two scientists, inventors of our technology, Dr. Rubin and Dr. Kanigan, with more than 30 years of experience in physics and chemistry. Three other founders, Alexander Yelsikov, Kirill Suslaparov, and myself, with more than 10 years of experience in business development. It's our honor to have our scientific advisors, Professor Boldarev and Professor Boldareva, who are the world-known experts in our technology. Our clinical advisor, Dr. Karp, professor of Stanford University, bone disease expert, who has more than 27 years of experience leading the development of drugs working with Roche, Merck, and other pharmaceutical companies. We are working with Camarga Group, who specializes with 505B2 applications specifically, which allows us to go through accelerated pathway. We are raising $5 million to get us through preclinicals and phase one studies. Join us in bringing the first bone fracture drug to market. Thank you.
Hi. My name is Sunny Jane, CEO and founder of Sun Genomics. We're a microbiome health company creating precision probiotics. Our bodies are made up of trillions of human cells, and each of those cells houses your DNA. And between the two of you sitting next to each other, your DNAs are 99.9% .9 similar. Our bodies also house trillions of microbial cells, and each of those cells houses their DNA, known as the microbiome. And between the two of you, your microbiomes are only 10% similar. You're 90% unique. At Sun Genomics, we're interested in what makes you unique and how your uniqueness is associated with health and disease. In fact, your unique microbiome has not only been associated with health, but also the risk for chronic conditions, conditions that span our lifetime, such as obesity, diabetes, arthritis, or gastrointestinal issues. Well, my son had a gastrointestinal issue a couple years ago, and I didn't know what to do, so I thought I would test his gut microbiome, and the simplest thing, go pick up a probiotic. So I ran to the store, I get to the probiotic aisle, and this is what I found. Hundreds of probiotics to choose from. I'm a microbiologist, and I couldn't tell the difference between room temp and refrigerated and the high CFUs, the concentrations, and the strains. So I didn't take one probiotic that day. I took tons of probiotics off the shelf, and I didn't go home. I went to the lab, and I started testing these probiotics. And we developed two key assays, a gastric survivability assay, so I could test whether or not when you ingest these supplements, would it actually survive your stomach acid and get to your site of health benefit? And then two, a DNA metagenomic sequencing assay, so I could determine at the strain level what's in these products. And the results of that study were astonishing to me. 85% of the probiotics off the shelf didn't survive the gastric system. Only 15% survived. And furthermore, the DNA metagenomics revealed there were several strains within these products not listed on the label. So to me, this creates a real divide. Hundreds of millions of Americans suffering from these microbiome-associated diseases, and the first consumer solution that we turn to in a $3.7 billion global market, it doesn't work. So I went back to my son's microbiome profile. I looked at the specific species-level calls we were able to make and matched that precisely to the species-level probiotics that would be best for him. And then I quickly realized I'm not the only one that's faced this challenge before. And that's why I created Flore, Precision Probiotics, a custom-formulated probiotic based off of one's gut DNA microbiome profile. And it's real easy. You can go on sungenomics.com today, subscribe to Flore for $99 a month. We're going to ship you your microbiome collection kit at your convenience. Collect a microstool sample, send it back to the Sun Genomics lab. We'll then provide you with your full microbiome signature as well as three months of custom formulated probiotics. Now, we're able to accomplish all of this through two key innovations. First, our patented methodology around whole genome sequencing to custom formulate probiotics. This allows us to get down to the species level calls in your gut microbiome and match that precisely with the species level organisms for your probiotics. Second, we've also thought through the gastric survivability of the probiotics, thinking of the dosages, the strains, and the storage conditions so you can have maximal benefit. These two key innovations have enabled our customers to realize significant health benefits. Here's Caroline's profile. So Caroline shared with us that she has rheumatoid arthritis, some inflammation, and was actually experiencing pain. And what you're seeing here is before Flore and after Flore. And before Flore, Caroline's profile showed, highlighted in yellow here, a high level of C. difficile, a gram-negative known inflammatory microbe. But three months after being on Flore, Caroline's C. difficile concentration dropped by 40%. And she reported back to us that the pain had subsided. 
And what's more is the good microbes in our gut, the bifidobacteria, the rosburia, they had all increased by over eightfold or more. So we had rebalanced Caroline's microbiome. Meet Sean. Sean's lactose intolerant. In two months after being on Flore, Sean was able to go out and enjoy a slice of cheese pizza and not feel that stomach pain or any bloating. Meet Jordan. Jordan is a registered dietitian for a Bay Area sports team wearing a red shirt. I can't go any further than that. <laughs> two weeks after being on Flore, Jordan felt that boost in energy. So we've been able to reach customers like Caroline and Sean and Jordan through two key channels, our direct sales channel and digital marketing, and then our affiliate marketing through health and wellness clinics as well as medical clinics. And Sun Genomics is currently pursuing licensing opportunities to engage the international market. Our customers and our sales come from six key segments, and we found beachhead markets in food allergies, chronic conditions, and athletic performance. Since our pilot program in June of 2017, we've commercialized Flore, and the last four months we've seen month-over-month -month growth of over 50%, enabling a lifetime value of over $900 that continues to grow as we haven't added any subscribers leave. And we're not just a test, so we're actually providing the solution. We're providing the probiotic and providing value and revenue-generating opportunities across the value chain of probiotic manufacturing. We've already got over 30 strains in our repository and continue to expand that, and we continue to manage and mine our IP landscape. We've got three provisional patents filed, one international PCT, and one U.S. fast track. And there's more. As we get to 1,000 microbiome profiles, 10,000 microbiome profiles, we'll begin to understand which probiotic strains work best for the mass market and then drive those strains into functional foods, your kefirs, your yogurts, your smoothies, so billions of people can benefit from healthier microbiomes. This is all not possible without a fantastic multidisciplinary team, 80 years of combined experience. I myself in NGS Sciences, we've got experts in laboratory science, neuroscience, bioinformatics, software development, process engineering, and we round out our expertise with a fantastic medical and scientific advisory board, not only providing guidance on the commercialization side, but thinking through of the regulatory components of ISO standards, GMP manufacturing, clinical standards, and FDA regulations. Sun Genomics has the leadership and the product to reinvent health through probiotics. We're raising $3 million to accelerate our growth, implement automation, and drive the next generation of probiotics. Please join our movement. Let's cure these microbiome-associated diseases by the year 2021. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Hello, my name is Paul Blum, and I'm really excited to share our technology with you. I, I'm a founder of Neurocaris. My company has invented a new way to treat human pain, because our mission at Neurocaris is to help improve the quality of life of people suffering from long-term chronic pain, and at the same time, to fight the opioid epidemic. That epidemic is getting worse. Almost five people die every hour in America because they overdose on prescription pain medications. These are highly addictive drugs, and the reason they're so addictive is because they're untargeted pain medications, so they act systemically in your body. You take them as a pill like OxyContin, it dissolves in your stomach, and it then enters your bloodstream, and all the tissues in your body are exposed to the drug. Any tissue with a cell that has an opioid receptor, also called a mu receptor, can be affected by this drug. And that's okay if it's a pain neuron, because you get pain relief, but it's a problem if it's a cell in your brain in the pleasure center, because you experience euphoria, which can lead to addiction. It's also a problem if it affects the breathing center of your brain, because that stops you from breathing, and people die when they overdose because they suffocate because of this untargeted side effect of the opioid. So, Botox is an example of a drug, it's in the cosmetic industry, which is used 
to treat a certain class of neurons, in this case motor neurons, and it's administered in a targeted way by injection. It freezes motor neurons, and those are the type of neurons that control your muscles. So when that happens, your muscles relax and your wrinkles go away. At NeuroCaris, we wondered, what if there was a way to do that same thing, a targeted way to treat pain neurons? And we came up with a way to do that, and we did that by protein engineering. We created a multifunctional protein that has the unique ability to bind to pain neurons, also called sensory neurons. During injection, it binds to the neurons, it enters the neurons, and only inside, it delivers a therapeutic payload. That therapeutic payload targets a protein called actin. Actin is what makes up the cytoskeleton inside of what's called an axon, which is a long finger-like projection that connects the neuron to your brain. When that happens, that neuron can no longer signal pain to your brain. It blocks the transmission of pain signaling. And the consequence is you no longer have the sensation. So we've tested our protein. It's called N001 in vitro using cultured neurons. And here we have sensory neurons from chickens on the left, sensory neurons from mice in the middle, and motor neurons on the right from um, chickens. And all three of these cultured cells produce long finger-like projections. Those are the axons. When they're just like human neurons in that sense. And when we treat them, only the sensory neurons respond. And they respond by retracting their axons because of this effect on actin. But the motor neurons don't respond at all because the drug doesn't bind to them, even at 20 times the effective dose we use to treat the sensory neurons. So, our drug N001 is highly specific for this subclass of neurons called sensory neurons or pain neurons. And we've also tested our drug in vivo using an animal model of inflammatory pain. So here we compete against opiates. And animals that have no pain control, there's no pain relief, so zero pain relief. And animals treated with our drug N001 by injection or the opiates both experience 100% pain relief except we're using one-fifth the molar dose of our drugs. So N001 is more potent than an opiate. We've also tested its duration, how long it lasts, in the same animal model system of pain. And both drugs work really well, the opiate and N001, after one day of treatment, but by day two, the opiates have worn off. You have to take another pill of an opiate to get pain control. Our drug is still working. By day three, our drug is still conferring some pain relief. So our drug is longer acting than an opiate. But by day four, our drug has also worn off. This is important because it means our drug is reversible. That means there's no permanent damage to these pain neurons. They regain full function as do their axons. We're interested in the global pain market. That's a $32 billion annual market. And in the United States, we're targeting osteoarthritic pain. That's about 10% of the US population, so nearly 30 million people. Reasonable size market. We have intellectual property around our invention, including an exclusive license for all fields of use, both the drug N001 and the delivery system, which means our multifunctional engineered protein can deliver other therapeutic molecules specifically to pain neurons. We have excellent publications on our technology, including in the top journals in the field of science. And we've assembled an advisory board that includes two pain medical doctor specialists, one of whom is the president-elect of the American Association of Pain Medicine and is at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as a veteran from the pharmaceutical industry who is a project manager with expertise in preclinical drug development and clinical trials. So together with my partner, Ben Pavlik, we have over 30 years of protein engineering experience. And our technology was recently recognized by the National Institutes of Drug Abuse because of its potential to fight the opioid epidemic. We are currently in preclinical development, which means we're testing our drug further in animal models, particularly pain models. And in order to complete those studies, we are raising $3 million. So I invite you to join us, join our revolution in pain management, and help us fight the opioid epidemic. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Salzman, 
the founder and CEO of Cernalytics, and we're developing the next generation of biomarkers to diagnose and treat, hunt and treat dementia. <laughs> dementia is an epidemic affecting 45 million people worldwide. And as the population ages, this number is set to grow to 135 million by 2050. Spending in the dementia space has exceeded $600 billion per year, making it the largest of any disease area. And the challenge is, is that dementia is actually a blanket term used to describe a number of diseases that at their very earliest presentations look identical to a doctor. And because there's no access to the disease tissue for biopsies, such as in, just like there is in cancer, patients often undergo over a dozen tests over a four-year period of time just to reach a diagnosis that we know from retrospective studies are incorrect 25% of the time. This means that one in every four patients that's enrolled in a clinical trial doesn't even have the disease that the drug was designed to treat. This has contributed to an almost 100% failure rate for drugs in this space, costing companies over a billion and a half dollars and 10 years of time per failure. This is not normal. No other disease experiences failures like this, and in fact, it's so bad that it prompted the FDA to come out with new guidance mandating drug developers to incorporate new biomarkers into their clinical trials that can enroll patients with early-stage dementia. However, no such test exists on the market and has left drug developers scrambling to find a solution. I recognized this need four years ago when I was working as a scientist at Biogen, and I left my job there to pursue a vision to turn small RNAs into biomarkers. I have 15 years of experience in the small RNA biomarker space, and I started grad school working on them when there were only six labs in the entire world studying them. My graduate thesis focused on uncovering the mechanisms by which small RNAs are formed and how they function in our cells biologically, and my fellowship at the Yale Cancer Center focused on turning these small RNAs into diagnostics for cancer, to not only diagnose disease, but also to direct medical therapies for patients coming into our clinic. What we learned from my work is that all of the tissues in our body have a unique small RNA classifier associated with it that can actually do things like tell you what tissue of origin the disease is originating in. And we also understand that diseases originating in our brain will send out unique signals throughout our body that we can then detect in a liquid biopsy and turn into the diagnostic molecules that the FDA is calling for. So to do this, we've developed an end-to-end -end discovery pipeline to identify small RNA biomarkers that we call cernotypes. However, we see two addressable markets here. Number one, to fill the need for the clinical diagnostics that the FDA is calling for, and also a second market to test pharmacodynamics that we know will be immediately opened as soon as this first diagnostic need is met. And we are currently simultaneously developing these products to meet both the current and future needs. The big, the big difference is in our data. A lot of companies right now are working in small RNAs. However, they're limited to a list of 2,588 genes. And at Cernalytics, we've developed a novel computational algorithm to process, sort, and analyze the small RNA sequencing data, giving us high visibility resolution to sequences at the single nucleotide level. What this does is it's expanded our discovery set to over 250,000 unique targetable entities, giving us over 100 times power to discover compared to our competitors. To develop proof of concept, we analyzed small RNA sequencing data from a group of patients harboring a genetic form of dementia. And we were able to produce this extraordinary heat map. This is a game changer and no other method in the world can produce data like this. What you're looking at is a sternotype for Huntington's disease. And in this heat map, every column represents a patient and every row represents a biomarker. And as you can see, all of the small RNA biomarkers in green are only present in the Huntington's patients and they are never found in the healthy controls. Similarly, all of the biomarkers that you see in red are only found in the healthy people and are never found in the diseased. And these are also indicative of all of the normal biology that is lost when a patient gets sick. What we've built is an extraordinarily powerful classification tool that companies can use to derive unambiguous 
yes-no information to direct patient decisions in clinical trials. However, we understand that in order to make our technology scalable, we have to come up with a non-sequencing-based solution. So we turn to RTQPCR, and we do this because it's a fast, cheap, easy-to-use test that can be deployed throughout the entire world. And we develop these targeted assays against our sequences, and we validate our computational data. We have six patents filed on our, in our space. We have one PCT filed on our method to develop cernotypes, as well as five additional patent applications spanning different types understanding different subtypes of dementia. And as our products move through the FDA approval process, we unlock larger and larger targetable markets. Having filed our patents, we, we are, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> having filed our patents, we can now begin selling our cernotypes into a 30, $33 million addressable market. And what we're doing right now is we are, farm, we are forming a coalition of researchers, neurologists, and clinicians around Dr. Richard Myers, our scientific advisory board member. And he's going to the FDA to file a letter of support to use our biomarkers in clinical trials. These letters of support are a mechanism that the FDA uses to gain support for investigational use of new biomarkers in clinical trials. And when we've generated a big enough use space, we will go back to them and file a biomarker qualification package, at which point, we will become the de facto enrollment marker for every patient presenting with dementia. Over time, we can file for a 510K approval, at which point we will unlock the entire market of everyone over the age of 65, which is valued at $138 billion. We are currently validating our biomarkers with four academic collaborators, and we've been in talks with a number of pharmaceutical partners who want to incorporate our cernotypes into their drug development programs. We have an exceptional team. I have over 15 years of experience spanning both academia and industry. Nathan, our CTO, brings 15 years of experience in computation and big data analytics and drives all of our computational-based discovery. Alan, our COO, has over 45 years of experience bringing high-tech innovations from concept to worldwide implementation. And Sean Melville leads our business group with over five years of experience in the diagnostic space. When I started Cernalytics, I had a vision to make us the world leader in small RNAs. So I built an advisory board in accordance with that. Dr. Frank Slack is a Harvard professor and discovered the first human microRNA. And Dr. Richard Myers um, cloned the Huntington's gene and has discovered small RNAs in Huntington's disease as well as Parkinson's. And Dr. Joanne Wiedis is a pioneer in the use of small RNA biomarkers in cancer. We are Cernalytics, and we're raising $4 million to help Cernotype dementia. Thank you. There are millions of individuals whose lives have been shattered, either due to a sudden accident or an unfortunate illness. Many of them have lost the ability to communicate, either temporarily or permanently. My name is Francois Guern. I am the founder and CEO of Nero. And at Nero, we aim to change that. The largest group of individuals that we define as touchless and voiceless is stroke victims. Stroke victims have a common denominator. They have aphasia, or the inability to speak correctly, and they have upper limb weakness or paralysis. As you can see in this picture, stroke can bring an individual to such a demeaning point that life no longer matters. The World Health Organization indicates that 17 million new strokes will happen this year worldwide. That's one new first-time stroke every two seconds. We estimate that 33% of these individuals will become touchless and voiceless. At Nero, 
we have realized that certain neurological signals from the frontal part of the human head could be utilized to control and navigate a computer information system. We have developed a solution called NUOS, the Neural Operating System. In this example of a NUOS user interface, we use a versatile set of interactive tiles for that patient to communicate in various ways. For instance, the patient may indicate that he or she is in pain and further indicate what kind of pain it is. We do so by using EEG, electroencephalography, and EOG, electrooculography. We bring those into a set of algorithms and define what we call fusion. We seek for a very specific signature in those neurological signals for us to control what we call the radar. The radar itself navigating the interactive tile as previously mentioned. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Henry Evans. Henry is a Stanford MBA. He's also a past CFO in Silicon Valley. He's a three times TEDx speaker and also a representative to the US Congress. And he's also a stroke victim at the prime age of 40. Let me show you what Henry and Nuas can do together. So go to Alexa, the first one, to let's play the music, oh, to go to the music, number one. Alexa, play some top 40. Top 40 from Spotify. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Sending emergency messages. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Here I am happy. He's interacting with the radar to communicate daily routine messages. I am hungry. And you can also custom type. Go to Alexa. Alexa, hi. Hi there. Wow. <laughs> and we just start to Alexa. Yeah. I remember the days when he came out of the coma and he would count the dots on the ceiling and they became his friends. And we laugh about it, but it's not funny because you are literally a prisoner in your body. What's so important here is the independence that he's doing it himself. It's the dignity of the human being that is being brought here that is so huge. You can't take that away from a human being. You can't. It is absolutely huge that he's able to do that on his own. No help. Mm. Awesome. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm. <laughs> As you can see, Nuance is able to assist not only the patient, but also a loved one, and also a doctor, a nurse, a professional caregiver. We aim to make Nuance as affordable as possible. This price here on a monthly subscription basis represents actually a total adjustable market over, over $10 billion worldwide. We are seeking specific reimbursement codes in various jurisdictions around the world to again bring Nuance technology to the people and their family that need this type of communication and computing. 
We believe that neurons can assist in acute care, such as stroke, traumatic brain injury, locked-in syndrome, ICU, post-operation, tracheotomy, and so on, as well as rehabilitation and home-based care. We're very excited to be partnering very soon with the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. Our goal in this process is to define the efficacy and efficiency of the communication created using nuance between patients and doctors, as well as looking at the advantage of nuance for neuroplasticity, as well as improvement in rehabilitation, and also cost savings due to the depth and speed of this new method of communication that does not exist previously. Our team is composed of five key individuals. I am the founder and CEO. I have been in tech for 24 years. I've built organizations from zero to $20 million globally. And I'm also an ex-Google senior OEM partner. Abhinav Kumar, also a co-founder and amazing CTO, is a IIT Bombay graduate and an expert in human-computer interaction and brain control interfacing. Pascal has been a senior executive in the medical device industry for 30 years. He's been a VP EMEA and VP Global of Hewlett Packard Medical, Philips Healthcare, GE Healthcare, Walsh Allen, and Hiram. Chris is our chief AI officer. He's a data expert for the, gov for the government of Canada, as well as the Canadian Armed Forces Health Services. And Julia is our CFO. She is a certified global management accountant with expertise in private and public companies in the United States, Canada, as well as Europe. We are supported by an outstanding advisory board. From Dr. Simon of Arduin of MIT and Berkeley to Dr. David Kopfer from Yale and the National Academy of Medicine, and much more. We have experts that are board certified in neurology, clinical psychiatry, military medicine, and more. Our IP is composed of various patents, both provisional and non-provisional, and we are a sponsored company globally by Norton Rose Fulbright since 2016. This has been an amazing year for us. We started with Google, uh, backing us with a $100,000 grant and winning two MIT competitions for the future of healthcare hacking and also the MIT Barracuda Bowl across all healthcare categories. We're in the midst of this IRB with the Monsanto Health System and also determinations from Health Canada and the FDA. We will be focusing on those clinical trials both in the United States and Canada for 2018, followed by commercialization in Canada and the United States next year, and then Europe. I'm excited to announce that we are raising $2.7 million for commercialization, as well as our profitability within the next two years. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to speaking with you outside. Take care. I'm Joe Litvak, CEO of Lingrove, and we make wood without trees. Here are my kids at Sequoia National Park recently. My son Elias at the end asked, how is it, Dad, that these trees grow 30 stories tall with a trunk not much wider than my arm span? The answer is, these trees are made of nature's highest performance material. The wood in these trees has a stiffness to weight ratio of steel. And so it remains the ideal material for our interiors and our exteriors. From our chairs to our entire homes, wood adds a wonderful aesthetic and amazing durability. Unfortunately, 87% of old timber forests are gone forever. This is a non-renewable resource. In fact, it represents a $50 billion black market today. And supply is going down, demand and prices are increasing. And in that, Lingrove has our opportunity to make a better than wood replacer 
and it starts with flax. Flax grows in 100 plus days versus 300 plus years for old wood. It's CO2 negative, requires no irrigation, and there's no shortage of flax. In fact, Canada grows a million tons a year for the seeds and throws away the stock. We use the stock in our continuous processing spinning machine you see here in a massively scalable process to make our better than wood replacing fiber. And we blend it with our better than wood resin, better than lignin, it's a bio-based resin from non-food sources which is recyclable. And so we have our better than wood fiber and our better than wood resin, and we have our better than wood replacer, and we call it ECOA. ECOA is wood without trees. We sell it on a hundred yard long rolls about the length of a football field. And once layered into a mold, this material becomes structural. Here is a detail of a sink that we made for the largest interiors fixtures company in the world. And they picked Lingrove because our material, our eco material is the only material that allows for 3D moldability that you see here. Today, we're offering ECOA in this long roll form and as structural panels, such as the one you see here. This is a higher stiffness to weight ratio than wood. In fact, it has 10 times the strength of wood in tensile strength terms, and over four times the stiffness from a stiffness to weight perspective. And so today, we're replacing carbon fiber in test quantities, including in this fly rod project you see here, as well as arrows, paddles, and board sports. Blackbird Guitars has replaced old growth rainforest wood in thousands of instruments, making higher performance and beautiful instruments using ECOA. And I'm pleased to announce that we have an LOI in place with the largest commercial interiors company in the world. We're selling to several of the largest furniture companies in pilot quantities, as well as in auto interiors in pilot quantities. And so our business model is pretty basic. We take our bio-based resin and blend it with our flax linen fibers and make ECOA on rolls and in panels. And we offer that to the interiors industry first at a 30% net margin, followed by transportation at a 25% margin, and eventually construction at a 20% net margin. Today, we're in the composites industry, replacing woven carbon fiber at roughly $3 a square foot. As we scale, prices will drop to $2 a square foot, fitting us perfectly into the interiors market, an $80 billion total addressable market, including transportation, residential, and commercial interiors. And as we continue to scale, our prices will drop to $1.50 a square foot, making us perfect for the construction industry. This $150 billion total addressable market is scheduled to double to $300 billion by 2050. This is a tremendous opportunity for both our company to grow and for us to reduce CO2 emissions by roughly two-thirds. We have an issued patent making structural panels using natural fibers. We have a non-provisional continuation on the same patent to extend that patent into further verticals. And we have trade secrets on the resin formulation, the processing, and allowing for turnkey usage by our end customers. We have a wonderful team to make this happen. I started in composites over 15 years ago at Ferrari and scaled the first product to market using ECOA. My partner, Desi Bonatow, created the largest eco resins company, which he's since sold. Marcos Vanek is our director of business development with over 20 years selling in the composites industry to large customers. And Sonia Travellini heads up our biomaterials and is our in-house life cycle analysis expert. Our team of advisors have 70 plus years of experience from industry to academia. Ed Pipple has scaled the largest thermoplastic composites company in North America, 
Larry Lessard is a PhD, an expert in biomaterials from McGill University, and Chris Citizenstock is working with Sidewalk Labs to make some of the largest eco-friendly developments in the world. As far as milestones, in one month's time, we'll have a continuous roll of our interiors version of ECOA material. By October, our pilot machine will be in place, running at approximately 5,000 square feet per day. By January of 2019, we'll be producing 10,000 square feet per day, roughly 5 million square feet per year, which is essentially Portland, Oregon, to Los Angeles in material, representing $10 million in revenues. We're raising $3 million today to help us scale to get to the point where we can address the interiors market by the end of this year. I look forward to meeting you after the event. You're welcome to the sit in a chair, a real chair made out of material in the lobby, and I meet you then. Thank you much. Hi everyone, my name is Pedro Carvalho, I'm a veterinarian from Portugal, and I'm also the founder and CEO at Vet Therapy. Now we all know that society is changing, and these changes have deeply impacted the animal care industry. I believe most of us have pets at our homes. We are now part of a generation of millennials that have what we call modern families. They have pets before they have children, and they treat their pets as part of a family. And that's how it should be. Eight million U.S. millennials became new pet owners in 2017, and they are now the largest population in the world of pet parents. However, when a crippling disease like osteoarthritis, for which current medicine offers absolutely no solution, affects our pets, guess what? The whole family suffers. The entire routine and quality time spent together get completely disrupted. Last year, Americans spent $30 billion. Now that's $30 billion to address the clinical needs of almost 200 million pets. And these numbers will continue to rise over the next few years. We know that 30% of these animals are diagnosed with osteoarthritis. And we also know that over 100 million will have to address some type of wound or skin injury throughout their lives. Regenerative medicine has been unraveling different solutions for many of these problems. The results of stem cell application around the world are truly amazing and very inspiring. Blinds that begin to see, paralyzed that regain their movements, deaf that start eating for the first time. These are exciting times for healthcare. Sometimes the future is actually happening right now. So why not bring these solutions to the pets we love? And that's exactly what we do at Vet Therapy. We develop and optimize stem cell therapies and regenerative products for veterinarian application. We were able to overcome one of the major difficulties with the application of stem cells. That is, once we get these cells ready to be injected, how can we keep them alive and viable long enough for them to reach different destinations without the need for further processing? And that's why we ship our cells in our proprietary medium, at room temperature, ready to be injected, and we keep cell viability up to 48 hours. This way we can deliver our cells anywhere in the world within this 48-hour window. Our patent wound-dealing hydrogel, based on the stem cell secretome, provides faster and clean healing with minimal scar tissue formation. So we're actually promoting full skin regeneration. We use the best source of stem cells in the adult body, adipose tissue. We can use other sources, but these cells have unique properties. They secrete a cocktail of factors, what we call secretome, that, provide, um, that suppress the immune response and inflammation, and at the same time promote healing and regeneration of damaged tissues. This allows us to stock these cells in cryobanks and later on use them in other uh, animals of the same species, what we call allogeneic treatments. Or we can just use them directly in the donor animal, what we call autologous treatments. We then apply this technology to different species, such as dogs, cats, and horses. 
Now I'm going to show you a couple of images of wounds, so if there's anyone a little more sensitive, please, now is the time to check your cell phone. We are already selling in Europe, and recently in the Middle East, and we have treated hundreds of animals. With our wound gel, we know we can accelerate healing. But more than that, using the same stem cell secret home source, we know we can address different types of wounds, and even different species, without any rejection and really great results. Even in chronic wounds. Nero is a Doberman of one of my students, and he had a chronic wound for almost two years. Now, she tried every possible treatment without any results. Then we gave her our wound gel, and we were able not only to close the wound, but actually see the air grow back again. So we know there was a remodeling of deeper layers of the skin. As for our stem cell injections to address, for instance, osteoarthritis, we have a success rate of 80 to 85%, which is significantly higher than the 50% usually reported. We see a decrease in pain and an improvement in joint mobility and overall functional recovery of the treated animals. Above, you can see a horse's rupture tendon that was completely healed in six months. And this is some of the feedback that we're getting. The ultrasound shows the tissue is completely regenerated. I can assure you that this is the most rewarding outcome that we could ever expect from all our work. Our business model is straightforward. We get our adipose tissue from reference veterinarian hospitals as a subproduct of some surgery or procedure that they are already doing, so no animal is armed. We then apply our technology to isolate and expand stem cells and their secretome, and we get our products ready for delivery, either to a distributor or directly to the veterinarian clinics. We can address osteoarthritis for $1,000, and our wound gel sells for $50, both with 80% margin. Now, as we enter new markets, like the US, we know that we have to address all the regulatory demands in order to sell our products. And as we started this process, we hope to be able to use all our data and publications, including our patent for the wound gel, both in Europe and in the US, to help shorten and expedite this process. None of this would be possible without an amazing and versatile team, composed of veterinarians, together with tissue engineering and material science experts. Among us, we have over 100 publications and more than a decade of experience in this field. We also rely on the knowledge and expertise of our advisors, like Jeff Gimbel, the father of adipose stem cells, to help us face any challenges ahead. And as we focus on the US market and deal with all the regulatory demands, we want to establish a GMP production center here and be able to scale up both production and sales while we keep expanding our portfolio of products. Now, as we do this, we are giving you the opportunity to participate in our business. We honestly believe we are already the best at what we do. Now, we just want to be the first to expand worldwide. Hope you can join us. Thank you. And a special thank you to Indibio for making all of this possible. Thank you all for uh, listening and uh, hearing about all these amazing companies. Uh, let's give a round of applause to all the teams. I mean, they have literally worked day and night, some of the teams sleeping in the lab multiple nights, uh, to make this kind of traction possible. If you think about how do you actually accelerate science, you accelerate it through working a lot <laughs> and setting crazy deadlines and then hitting them. And uh, it, it just comes at a really, really steep price of um, putting in the hours and the effort. And so I'm just incredibly proud of all the teams uh, that have been working on this. So thanks. And thank you all uh, for coming and for listening. And I think, you know, one of the amazing parts is this is the beginning of a real renaissance that's happening in the valley and globally around biotech. Uh, we've been watching it happen and uh, is, watching it uh, accelerate has been quite amazing. I'd like to ask Sean O'Sullivan of SOSV to come in and uh, give a couple words as well. Thank you. Thank you. Was that amazing? That was just so phenomenal. I didn't know you could make bees work so hard. 
the, uh, and, and so many other incredible discoveries and incredible lessons that we have learned from these teams uh, over the time that we've been working with them, not just in the last four or five months, but also in just the discovery process, some of these teams we've talked to uh, for, for years and have actually looked to join IndieBio uh, for, for years. Um, I, I want to say, as an investor, SOSV, of course, all of our IndieBio staff uh, at SOSV are here with us on stage, but this is really just such an incredible thing to be part of. Um, and as investors yourselves, uh, selves, I'd love for you to think about not just uh, the, the financial returns, which uh, you should know, IndieBio has helped define whole new industries in cellular agriculture, and many of these companies have gone on, as you know, to raise tens of millions of dollars. And so an investment in some of these companies is certainly going to be a good financial return, but it's also way more than that. I, myself, uh, my mother died of Alzheimer's, my, my uh, child struggles with autism, uh, you know, many people that I know have cancer, Arvin's parents both have cancer. We are struggling with these issues as a society, as one of the speakers talked about in terms of the opioid addiction, five people an hour, just in the time that we've just been meeting here today, 15 people, 10, 15 people have died of these, these problems. These are massive, real problems facing all of the world. And so I want to encourage you to really use your money well by investing it into these great companies to really change society and advance the progress. Make what seems impossible, all these challenges that we, are, that we heard about today, uh, and that we know, because they're in our own lives, day by day, that we struggle with, we can make a difference by, by helping accelerate this change. So I hope, as investors, you really do take your responsibility uh, to society and to, to, your own, uh, to your own pocket as well. Uh, seriously, these are great investments that can really do good for the world. So uh, please meet up with the teams afterwards. And thanks again to these incredible, the, the incredible team at, at uh, SOSV, the entire IndieBio group here uh, that uh, makes this possible. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, for taking a chance on such a crazy idea as a biotech accelerator three years ago uh, when we talked about it first. So yes, uh, as Sean uh, mentioned, uh, it's time to meet the teams. Uh, it's a rare opportunity for them to have so many press and investors in the same place at the same time. So uh, I'd like you to kindly uh, step aside if you're not an investor or press member uh, for the first half hour to hour. Uh, so that way the teams can get through the important conversations around uh, fundraising uh, and spreading uh, the go their gospel uh, with their channels, with those appropriate channels first. Uh, afterwards, please feel free to step forward and, uh, and chat away. So thank you again uh, for your time, for your energy, and uh, for your uh, great involvement in uh, this booming renaissance. Uh, we'll see you outside, and we'll see you again in six months. Thank you. <laughs>